Bush Game Podcast about gamers with honest interview segments, asking questions, and fun of knowledge with the gaming industry peaks. Today, we have something here. You are very well known in the industry, but for those who don't know you yet, could, could we just at least start with a very brief introduction? And also, like, how are you today? <laughs> Great. Uh, hi, Machi. Thanks. Uh, it's always interesting, even for me, uh, running the podcast this day to uh, be a yeah. guest. So it's like I have to switch my mindset because I'm all still still in question mode. Uh, yeah, I'm great. Uh, I'm enjoying the summer, uh, uh, allowing myself yeah. a break. Actually, I can talk okay. about that I more. See. And uh, yeah, and uh, a bit about myself uh, to summarize. I'll try to uh, describe something out of my bio, okay. but yeah, I've been working in the industry for quite some time now, um, 13, 14 years, still worth mentioning, and uh, production and product management and leadership of studio teams. So I worked also in different places, uh, Berlin, Helsinki, Paris. So I've seen also a bit of different culture, different organization. And... I would say today my main focus uh, throughout my journey has been really in building teams, studios, uh, creating a, a culture, effective culture to, uh, you know, allow, enable uh, creative people to create the best uh, game. So I'm focusing more on the environment than the game mm -hmm. itself. And um, on the side, which is not a small part now, I've developed a platform called Rise and Play to uh, be really a platform of knowledge sharing for any mm -hmm. leaders in the gaming industry to, first of all, I think, open the conversation around practices of what I call conscious leadership. And I can oh, yeah, talk yeah, more I'm about super what excited I mean. To hear more about <laughs> that. Yeah, so I, I have had the masterclass that I put online uh, and um, uh, intentionally for okay. free uh, to be accessible for as many entrepreneurs and founders as possible. And it evolved into the podcast where also I focus more as well on other leaders and sharing where they share directly their practices. So nice. um, I've been really supporting the ecosystem and also in, I've been a part-time investor as nice. well uh, related to this mission of uh, helping, elevating the whole ecosystem. Of nice. The okay, so so let's start with the, with the masterclass actually because uh, that's really interesting. Well, the, uh, giving it for free, it's, uh, it's one, one part. To be accessible nice but like why exactly you have created it uh, and i know you mentioned like who is it for but what was the first initial idea about like okay so i need to create the master class where did it come from so i i remember when i was building the new studio um, mm -hmm. at vodou casual studio so the way also uh, we were opening studio uh, at Vodou was very autonomous, mm -hmm. independent. Like, okay, you're okay. hired. Uh, we expect you to deliver a game next year. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> start. Nice, okay. <laughs> I was like, uh oh, okay. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was like, um, okay, how do we hire? How do I start? It was a very overwhelming time because my brain was mm -hmm. racing all direction. And as I looked for resources, like how to start, uh, should I hire now? Should I focus on the game vision? Uh, then I, I, I uh, design a whole framework and process for myself to have structure, uh, focus, mm -hmm. and uh, be effective. So I did it for myself at first, and as I went through the whole process and finding out that it was there was very little mm -hmm. materials uh, online or in gaming to uh, give uh, some sort of a guide uh, to build a, a brand new studio. I wanted to structure it for myself, document it for myself, so I could teach other uh, mm -hmm. people uh, who would want to build a studio. So at first, it was really not planned to be uh, scalable and just sharing. And as I uh, attended many talks, repeating yeah. the same thing over and over again, I realized, okay, maybe a format that is mm -hmm. more scalable is maybe to um, create documentation, template, put it online and I was also highly inspired by, I think Joachim was doing the same with yep. uh, game developers for founders or how do you yep. pitch, for example. And so um, I decided to try. So it was really trying and I, I was um, also following the masterclass, so the okay. actual uh, yeah. masterclass platform. 
and um, it inspired me to a bit the same thinking as with game, uh, like an MVP. Let's try. I released uh, one first module mm -hmm. and then the second, and then I I I, I got known uh, about it, and I got a lot of feedback uh, from people who. Uh, were really validating that it was needed, that it didn't have this kind of material. And the reason also why I made it for free, because at first I was asking myself very, uh, I would mm -hmm. say by default, I said like, how do I monetize it? And I was, <laughs> wait a minute, like, why <laughs> yeah, are you yeah, doing yeah. this? <laughs> why are you, no, why are you doing this again? It's like, do you, you need to monetize? I have a full-time job. Yeah. I have a good salary. It's not that I was looking to make more money. So I was thinking, what do I really want to achieve here? And when uh, getting to the core where it was, I really want to support mm -hmm. other leaders to build more effectively teams, but also focusing on the right thing, people, culture, values. That's what I want to see. So I thought, well, then I need to make yeah. it free to make it more accessible and then to see really uh, the vision that I, I saw to happen. So. Nice. Yeah, well, it's a very similar thing happened to me um back in days when I, I, I was working at Pixel Federation and we were trying to soft launch a game and I started trying to find any resources out there. I was like, there was just zero. I was like, hmm, okay, let's, uh, yeah, let's try to, to come up with uh, something. And then, you know, all these soft launch uh, frameworks uh, came up as well uh, because it wasn't just there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also don't monetize it because why? Just let's just share as, as much knowledge as, as possible so others can learn as well. And I guess... Mm -hmm. it's uh it comes uh, we can come back to the to the podcast as well and um i've seen you're kind of like showcasing a lot of female leaders from the gaming industry which is amazing and kudos for that i, I love it like what was that the goal from the start or just uh you know some somehow evolved so the podcast is really an evolution of mm -hmm. the master class so back again to what I wanted to create with Rise and Play was really focusing on leadership practices. And the masterclass started with uh, my own practices. So I was sharing my framework. And um, when uh, people were asking me, when is the next uh, masterclass and so on, and I, I put a lot of work into it. And also, I don't generate yeah. knowledge uh, like this. So I... I I had to mm -hmm. experiment, practice different things uh, with a team so I could actually get knowledge yeah. out of it. So it was not scalable as is. And then I felt like if I want to keep uh, uh, mm -hmm. the conversation around leadership practices, there are so many other practices from other people. Uh, maybe there's an overlap with what I shared. Maybe there are other ways. But the uh, theme remains the same where we put uh, you know the people really at the center mm -hmm. of how we think about uh, leading uh, a business mm -hmm. and a team. So um, when I thought of trying to bring uh, speakers in the masterclass to create the content, it didn't sound mm -hmm. scalable yeah. to me. And I think the most natural uh, evolution was podcasts where it's like, what if I could try in a format of one hour, an episode, but they share really mm -hmm. all the insights on a specific topic. And at the first season, so I approached it very as well with the product management thinking, like MVP yep, okay. first season, I commit on six months and I uh, look for guests that are all around mm -hmm. leadership okay. practices have been visible in some way or helping the industry. And uh, at the end of the six months, I measured the results. So I, I checked with myself, how do I enjoy doing it? Do I want to mm -hmm. keep doing it? Uh, what people liked? Uh, what were the episodes that got the most traction and why? And the thing that uh, was very clear, all the episodes with female speakers were yeah, <laughs> much course. bigger. Yeah, and okay. I, I wonder, like, okay, why? It's like, and my audience is, by the way, 50-50. Nice. So I don't yeah. just okay. have yeah. women, but I... The, when I saw that actually the focus on, on women was actually maybe uh, mm -hmm. a gap to uh, uh, a thin, then I thought, okay, why not focusing as a test my second season mm -hmm. only on female speaker and see what happens. And when I did that, then I had another lev layer, level of traction where a even sponsor mm -hmm. came to me and say, okay, well, you are really creating content on leadership and giving visibility, yep. representation, of more women in executive roles and how they approach, you know, their position. Nice. Okay. And uh, when you said you you measured the the first season, like what were the KPIs actually to you know 
So we are in the in the gaming yeah, int- industry and the the KPI world. Oh, how 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 did you measure that? In, you know, that's that's interesting. Yeah, and I I get well advised actually for, uh, from other podcasters who I ask, for example, mm-hmm. Mishka yeah. from the Constructor of Fun, how he was looking at it, and Joachim. And uh, I think Mishka gave me a very good advice. Like, don't yeah, look at numbers. Yeah, exactly. Don't yeah. look at numbers, Sophie. <laughs> and from the start, it's like, it, it takes some time to grow and so on, especially on the first year. Uh, that's not so, so important. It's like, okay, coming from, uh, you know, someone who's like product manager, very business oriented. It's like, and I, I didn't understand it at first. Um, now I understand after mm. a year and like having a, you know, slow but steady growth. Uh, I think the main important metric for me was how do yeah, I feel okay. about uh, creating the content because uh, we do f- this and you are doing this, I mean, for free at, exactly. when we start and why again are we doing this? So I asked myself what what's in it for me as well as I produce this. And I think it, it, uh, it gave me even more um, uh, mm-hmm. clarity of my motivation of pursuing the podcast where I love to connect with other leaders in the industry. So that was a, so I would call them mm-hmm. anyway yeah. and have a conversation. And here I just happened to record it and okay, I invest uh, of course my own money in editing it and uh, post-production and all the things, yeah. you know, and release it to share it with others. But it's such a small part of actually the, the real, like, you know, uh, personal reward for me to connect and learn also from others. So since that moment is like everything is a bonus. Like if it grows, yeah. it's a bonus. It's mm-hmm. not the goal, but the numbers are more. Um, I would say an additional validation that it's going somewhere. And I'm, I'm getting better at what I'm doing with the podcast, but it's not the ultimate goal because it's not mm-hmm. uh, meant to be a business yeah. to uh, monetize. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm, pretty, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because we all also like we are in in this space for like eight months maybe with the two and a half gamers and uh, <clears throat> numbers were never a KPI because well first of all we are having fun while doing it and it was exactly the same motivation like hey so we are talking to each other on a weekly basis and it's kind of fun and we share knowledge like why we are not actually recording it because we had this call and then there was one other friend who said that like hey guys like you should actually record <laughs> okay well why not mm-hmm. <laughs> let's try that out and it, again it's uh for us it's growing as well and it's uh it's a very nice uh very nice feeling that actually it's uh it's valuable for others and that's yeah that's the main motivation well mm-hmm. okay in terms of the motivation i mean uh, uh that's a that's a nice segue because i think well i assume i've never done any any other job than just the ua management and i've been in the med- manager position but being a studio lead that sounds pretty hard so how do you approach the like the people's motivation uh, i think redefining first the position you know at the studio lead it, your focus can be in mm-hmm. so many things right you can focus on the game performance what kind of like being acting like a creative director, also uh, more uh, like people manager. So I think it's important uh, first like to for me to maybe explain how my mm. personal definition and back to the goals when we as a studio lead you are responsible for the yeah. outcome at the end shipping, of the day. Right? Shipping so the you are game. responsible <laughs> exactly and the performance of the game in some way. Um, and when I thought of how to get there and the most effectively once again it's uh, through a solid team a uh, team working well together uh, having the right mm. people in the right positions and having clarity of what they're why they are here and what they're uh, supposed to deliver and achieve in short midterm and long term so how i approach it was really first a team focus like who is mm. in the team uh, who i need who do i hire um, who do I put in which position or uh, who do I promote as internal lead, um, framing the vision and mission, where are we going, uh, why. So really defining, crystallizing those, the direction mm-hmm. and the, the values, not only the values, but behaviors. So values are, I would say, the starting point of, okay, what do mm-hmm. we stand for as a group? But behavior is like, how do we behave to each other when we give feedback, when we make decisions, when we plan, uh, how do we test our games, etc. How do we get feedback from players? So all the behaviors kind of uh, uh, set the mm-hmm. path of uh, the process 
that I'm not defining, but people who are in charge of process will define according to the values. So that's how we approach it more on really putting the frame on the why and to some extent mm -hmm. the what, but not so much on the how, like from the process or um, the type of games mm -hmm. we make or how we make it, because this is where people have ownership and put really like uh, have mm -hmm. accountability as well of what, what they do. So those were, uh, I would say, in, in terms of priority, how I approach the studio and it gave me a peace of mind as well to not have to think of a uh, mm -hmm. hundred yeah. things at the same time and just focus on the things that really have impact at the studio level, which is again for people and team. Yeah, and uh, you know, since everybody's different, and I've seen that before in my previous jobs, like uh, how do you how do you motivate your team? Because you know, on the whole studio, just to keep keep working, keep pushing. Do you have any any process to you know like how to find out who, like who is motivated by what exactly? So obviously my motivations are slightly different than my colleague, like mm -hmm. them. So it starts really this thinking starts from the hiring. So and this is actually fundamental to be uh, aligned. I would say from the beginning. Mm. So this is something I really pay attention to on uh, at, during the hiring process. Like. You know, well, what's your uh, what's your motivation? Where do, you, how do you want to grow? What's interesting for you? And of course, it's not such a direct question because most of the time people are not even aware. But uh, what I ask often is like, how do did they move from a mm -hmm. job to another? And it kind of I see a okay. pattern. And it's like, okay, is the person more motivated by growth or is the person motivated more by status? Which is again not nothing. Yeah, nothing of course. Wrong, yeah, right? yeah, it's but, just uh, a different yeah. type of motivation. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they are different. Like others are by, by the team. So it's like the environment for them didn't work before and they were searching for a long time. This environment, they would feel really secure, uh, you know, uh, where they would connect with others. So w for me, the environment, I imagine that we work well where the motivations of individual would align. That's exactly this, like having a shared why, why mm -hmm. we're here. And the focus has always been in our motivation as a group that we are uh, we love um, figuring it uh, out how to solve a problem, so falling in love more mm -hmm. with the process uh, rather than uh, the result, right? So it, it has never been a motivation for us to, uh, for the people I hire to become the VP in the next uh, two, three years because I don't even have... A, a promotion ladder yeah. like this internally. Okay. So I, I was very clear from the beginning, if that's what you look uh, mm. are looking for or managing a team in the next 12 months, I yeah, cannot okay. promise that. So it may not be a match. So uh, first, I think the match of motivation happens on a hiring level. And then, of course, things change as you have a team, you grow. So it's always being uh, in touch with a team. So I created the leadership system in the studio where I'm myself a studio lead, but there were leads per mm -hmm. craft and we uh, keep regular one-on-one -on -one with everyone in the studio to stay in touch with uh, how is the work for them uh, how is it aligned with their motivation individually or uh, as a group and what can we do and sometimes we have things of, of course where we have influence it's about assigning people on different mm -hmm. tasks uh, or sometimes they want to grow it's like providing training Sometimes they have conflicts and it touches their motivation. So how can we not support them by fixing it, but by giving them the tool to fix it for themselves? So there are things that can be solved. And sometimes people change their motivation along the way. And it's also yeah. a natural conversation where you say, look, uh, you know, you don't seem so fulfilled anymore. Um, it is noticeable. Mm -hmm. And you know, I want also to offer you the best environment that is motivating for you. If it doesn't work out anymore, yeah. should we, you know, yeah. should we okay. co uh, consider parting ways? And those conversations actually happen. Oh, yeah, of well. course. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, I mean, nobody wants to have that conversation, but it's super important. So is it uh, like uh, you are trying to really see the patterns before they actually appear? So like you said, someone is apparently not so... Um, happy anymore so you try to get to this person and try to discuss like what's what's going on and then try to solve the situation or just you know like waiting until everything crashes 
so we have different system in place and uh, uh, again it's like so uh, often I say uh, like approaching a team like a product but this is like so true for me in my in how my brain okay. works but for example using quantitative and qualitative right so quantitative is anonymous survey yeah, okay. for survey you just put it out same thing and uh, I would say uh, often I have people quite honest about mm. it when things were not going well, although they wouldn't tell me face to face in the one on one, they would not hesitate to put something low. And so I see as well when there's discrepancy, but it's a tool to help. And uh, my point is not like, okay, try to pin uh, and find the person who put a lower yeah, score, okay. but just to be aware, okay, there are people who are not aligned. And so when when it's I, I see those signs more on the quantitative level, it's like uh, for the mm -hmm. question I understand, is there misalignment on the mission or a lack of clarity, a lack of uh, concrete mm -hmm. plans. So something that I can do at my level or with the leads, we try to uh, fix it, you know, to give more visibility or answer some questions. And if it's uh, persisting at an individual level, for example, the person is not feeling like they're growing mm -hmm. or they don't have the space because they don't have enough uh, influence or mm -hmm. power because let's say they are not in a lead position, but someone else uh, is and they're, they're not the, there's not the space for them to grow this is something there are some cues to see it and I, it's a matter of practice can, can you, I, I will can share you, here can, some... can you share at least like one or two yeah yeah okay. so I will share some example that I have developed more by practice mm -hmm. right so I think one uh, very clear is disengagement of a person so you barely hear mm -hmm. from them when there's uh, a group conversation they don't participate mm -hmm. uh, they don't contribute so they seem a bit checked out uh, um, and that's actually you can spot it mm. even uh, online yeah. through calls i have uh, i have spotted it and um, i would say second cue is uh, the opposite so uh, uh, very very active but more in the uh, complaining mm -hmm. side so okay. pointing out that all the problems but not really wanting to yeah. own any solution yeah. right so it's and, and this is where I see like mm, something is uh, off. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, the person is very frustrated, and they are maybe not in the place where they, uh, yeah, they you know, be. want mm -hmm. even to think of a solution. Yeah. Okay. And what about the motivation in you know like these days where the market conditions are kind of like un uncertain? Like uh, it's most probably even harder these days, right? Yeah. Uh, so with my team, we were working quite a hard condition. Like we were working mm. also pandemic, but uh, with Vodou, so it's a very demanding uh, company leadership. You know, the hyper casual mm -hmm. oh, cycle, yeah, it, it has followed us uh, in casual development. So we always like follow the deadline that was mm. above our head. Um, and uh, something I've been very transparent with the team, and it's also in the, um, in the context of a job market. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, people can walk out and find a new job with a good salary tomorrow. Yeah, uh, and I, that's not what I'm offering here with a place and uh, the environment that is created. Uh, so anywhere you go, it will be uh, tough, and uh, maybe some places offer flexibility. So this is kind of standard, I would say these days. But what people are really craving for, at least the kind of ones I'm looking for, they really are craving for connection. Mm -hmm connection that you are being seen that somebody someone cares about yeah. you you know and not like uh if it's transactional contract where yeah. i pay you for a job work and then if you are not happy you walk out and i find someone else right and i think that's another side of a coin where the, i would say big job market like what we call the great uh, resignation mm -hmm. a lot of people move to places and the reason, top reason I hear about, it's not so much about the salary or, so, or yeah. like lack of flexibility, but also uh, not being in a environment where people really, or the management, the leadership seems that like they care about them, uh, yeah. that they can connect, you know, with others, that their personal life is respected through the work, you know, all those little things that makes uh, at the end of the day, the human of connection. I think they are really important and overlooked and that's how you win uh, you know when uh, I hear like how do you win talents it's like it's it's pretty straightforward yeah. <laughs> but this is uh takes time it takes time to build and it, it is doesn't give a short-term gain mm. 
So that I think what is uh, important is the motivation when uh, thinking of people and how do you keep a team together. Yeah, well, people don't want to be just a number in the Excel sheet. It's just mm. like that's very sad, but that happens and all happened to me uh, in the in the past, and uh, I definitely wanted to be appreciated and respected as uh, you know because I worked my ass off and uh, nobody cared yeah. nobody cared <laughs> mm. which is but sad and that's it exactly like what others uh definitely don't want and you know like you mentioned uh, now these days you can get like a millions offers during the you know uh, on, on linkedin we are all getting these and sometimes it's uh it's really interesting to maybe accept them or not and you made quite a big decision moving from Rovio to, to Voodoo in Berlin. Well, like, what was your thought process behind it? Because, I mean, I can imagine it should, could be a super hard, right? Mm. It, was a, it was a long process, so it just didn't happen uh, okay. overnight. Um, and uh, at Rovio at that time, I was uh, building a new team, going to soft launch with, um, it was Angry Birds Pop 2. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, a whole test for me, like how can I build a team uh, and and around a game and uh, and also keep my focus on mm. the pro product leadership. And I really uh, learned to enjoy the part that was really about team building, hiring, and building this strong creative team that will solve mm. complex challenges. So I knew at that time I really wanted to explore um, the position of. Uh, uh, studio mm -hmm. lead uh, and uh, I explored those possibilities at Rovio mm -hmm. and they were there and other companies and Vodou also was on the table so they came to me I was nice. uh, headhunted and what was appealing about uh, uh, this uh, venture at, mm -hmm. at the time uh, was really I I always ask myself like should I build my own company you know mm -hmm. it's like yeah. I I've, 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 once in a while it's like my but game company and uh, I talked to a lot of uh, entrepreneurs as well, building the company. I have built my own as well out of game. So I, I know also some reality of it. And um, there's a lot of admin you have to take care of, you know, fundraising, uh, take, you know, over, over all the you time when you have, takes all the time. You yeah. Have, yeah. And then when I thought really, what do I want to focus uh, on? And um do I want to exit the company or do I want mm. to grow and learn? And that has always been the crossroad question for me. And I was not going for an exit or I didn't want to build a company to yeah. have an exit. So I decided to go with Voodoo where I would learn all the experience to start a studio from scratch with some financial security backing mm. with Voodoo, of course, some autonomy, not full autonomy because I cannot make like all the games course, I want. Yeah. Uh, but I could hire the people I wanted and decide how we would work. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I would learn a lot. I would grow. And that's the best monetary yeah. reward if yeah, I can yeah. think of it. Like it's like the school of entrepreneurship, <laughs> you know. So it was no brainer for me to go for it because my main driver was really uh, growing to this position. Mm -hmm. And I can say today, like now I see beyond the studio, is like how can I contribute on an organization level when it comes to thinking about culture, mm -hmm. values, and people. Okay, yeah, you mentioned yeah culture uh, and and the hiring, especially like multiple times, and even when it comes to mon uh, motivation. So I know I've seen it uh, a lot. Like you are tr you were trying to find a lot of people to the Berlin studio. And uh, I've seen the game designer position up there for almost two years. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, it's super hard to find the good people. But when is is there any like timeline where you say just okay, so let's just hire anyone because we need those people, or is it just like yeah, okay, so I will be trying to find the proper people until I till I find them. So definitely more of a letter, um, the one of waiting. So the roles that were really long and hard uh, for us to find was technical artist and UX designer, uh, especially for the definition of a UX designer I had. Uh, yeah, sen senior game designer was a hard one as well for a long time. So again, my thinking has always been like, what a uh, long term. Yeah. And hiring someone uh, takes a lot of energy and time. Onboarding someone, so it's... It, like I see like a team dynamic is like a blob and each mm. time you add someone it, it shapes the blob yeah. to a certain place and then 
when you have someone uh, offboarding, the blob also changes. So it is a disruption at all the level. And so I thought, okay, if I hire really quickly someone just to, uh, to mm. match like the task, the role quickly, quick fix, and it doesn't work out, it's going to be very disruptive. And I will spend most of my time managing the onboarding and offboarding of a person and yeah. actually okay. it would take some time away from, uh, I don't know, product strategy, studio leadership, or even hiring other talents. Mm -hmm. So with that thinking, we've always, I had this conversation very openly with the team where sometimes they were like, we really suffer, we really mm -hmm. need a technical artist, or really need, and it's like, I explained uh, yeah. what I just explained to you. And I said, I think we should stretch a little bit more until mm -hmm. we find someone, we will manage it. We can outsource, we can, I have no problem to find someone to mm -hmm. do the work temporarily, mm -hmm. But uh, full-time hire, it's a real commitment and it will pay off by finding the mm. right fit, especially on a, uh, a cultural level. And I can say after three years of the studio, the ones that were uh, uh, really uh, found for the key roles, like technical mm -hmm. artists, uh, senior yeah. UX designer, then they didn't leave and they were really core people in the team and mm. they made a big difference. So it was worth the wait and the long search and also for myself to understand through the uh, process of uh, hiring, uh, having clarity who I wanted and mm -hmm. who I didn't want. You know, it's like dating. You, yeah. you, you have a kind of a vague idea of what you want at the beginning and you try and then when you are almost at the end, you think, no, this yeah, is not a match. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then yeah. you let go and then you learn something new through the process. Like, actually, this is so important among the criteria, mm -hmm. yeah. but now I know how to narrow my search. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I th that's that's a fair point. Uh, if you hire someone very quickly, then uh, he or she can join the the team, but then can do a lot of harm and then just leave, and then you need to repeat that process all over again, mm -hmm. which is not time like efficiently used. That's true. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, I know you 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 were kind of like uh, out there giving talks and then i think you also discussed this with mishka on, on the dof podcast like uh you killed the game and you were pretty open about it which is kind of rare sometimes uh because you know you kill a game you do it quietly and just you want to really mm -hmm. move on move on <laughs> so nobody <laughs> yeah. re nobody remembers <laughs> so how do you how do you do that like uh so everybody is kind of like happy because uh, you can imagine, and this happened to me a couple of times, like if you kill a game of someone, he or she can be really frustrated because, well, well it's, uh, it's his or her baby. Mm -hmm. How do you do it properly or, well, without uh, a lot of harm, actually? That's a great question. It was a whole process where um, we discussed uh, many times during the development, so it was Plantopia uh, mm -hmm. during soft launch. If uh, how much we believe in the game and what would be kind of a borderline gates that we had along mm -hmm. the way. So the, this question was always like with us, but uh, what I was focusing on is like let's make it our friend, you know, let's make it our friend that the question in a healthy way: should we keep working on this game or should we stop? It's not like a, a failure question, but a healthy question where mm. what should we be doing to avoid this situation or should we stop to focus on bigger things? So um, the team was actually prepared for this conversation, I would say six months already before it mm -hmm, actually happened. Okay. I was having this conversation very openly looking at the KPI and we were thinking like, okay, well, the, the main thing that worried us at the time was long-term retention and we didn't see it growing as we wanted. So we were very also critical about our mm -hmm. own metrics where if we want to be on a hit level, we, the bar is high, right? So let's, let's be honest with ourselves. And if we work on some features, we need to see a progress, at least on the long-term retention KPI. And those KPI were getting better, but not at the yeah. speed we wanted. And there was also the context of being at Vodou where we were accountable to deliver some results in a certain window. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and those things didn't match fully where, again, like the context is important of a, of a game company and the financial where maybe in another company, if you have a payback time of one, two years, 
it would have been fine. But at Vodou, yeah. it was really on the window of a year, and it was really borderline, which also mm. revealed to us like, is it the right game to develop here, where we will have support of a, uh, you know, Vodou machine mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. grow mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the game. And the more like we get like closer, really to. Uh, after working almost like uh, nine months, I think, mm -hmm. in soft launch, where we we went through a gate process, and then I was already telling the team before the meeting happened with the stakeholders, yeah. uh, it is tight, it is tight, yeah. and it's not looking that that great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and a decision I made as well, instead of uh, giving the power to the leadership to decide for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I sat down with my uh, colleague and also uh, mm -hmm. the senior product manager on yeah. the game where what is the decision we are um, uh, like uh, giving uh, during mm -hmm. uh, for this yeah. meeting. And we concluded that we, did, we didn't believe that uh, we could uh, make a big difference uh, in, um, I don't know, like we were given three months and we knew that it would be hard to do it. And so we said, if really we need to make a drastic change, how is our time uh, better spent in the next mm -hmm. six months? And we were leaning more to new projects with all the learnings we got rather than trying to really uh, make the drastic change at the risk of actually losing all the metrics and the performance yeah. of the game. So it was a very risky move. And we were more recommending to stop it because mm -hmm. we believed that we would have maybe more... Um, I would say contribution short term, that was the goal by doing new projects. So we own the decision of killing. And then I also mm. announced to the team yeah. this decision that we will bring to the leadership. And everyone understood the reasoning, didn't necessarily agree with it. Of course, that's normal. Yeah, <laughs> of course. But uh, they trusted me and trusted me and Marco a lot. So they knew mm. that we cared about the right things, about us as a team. Um, about working on the right game, uh, putting our efforts in the right place. And so even if it was a tough decision, they trusted my decision. And that was very powerful, actually, for me to come mm -hmm. at the stakeholder meetings. Like, you don't need to make this decision for us. We are making the decision. And, and then it was funny because the counterpart happened. They were mm -hmm. actually like, are you sure you want to kill? No, no, but maybe you should save. And then we had yeah. all the argument to say we thought about it. And we are set on our decision. Yeah. Uh, Can you share at least like one one argument, like what was uh, uh, in your case that uh, people can just imagine like, okay, so where did you draw a line? Okay, so they tried to convince you or, or ask like, are you sure? And then you said, I'm sure because, I don't know, you can't do it. You already... Yeah, so the, the homework we did as well before making a decision was uh, mm. really uh, pushing all the scenarios. So mm. one was we had... I would say uh, decision we made uh, in the core design and system of the game that didn't f uh, were not so thoughtful in terms of scale mm -hmm. of the complexity of the project, and so we knew we had to address this so the game becomes more accessible. But the big risk was really that we changed so much the nature of the game that it changes the CPI, everything, and yeah, so on. Okay. And uh, when we make the production plan as well, so we we met some pre-production estimates. We saw that it's minimum a work of six months. So mm. making this whole calculation, we saw if we work on new project, we can deliver prototypes put to market already in the first month because now we have all process. We, mm -hmm. we are very fast. Uh, and so when thinking of the ROI, actually of mm -hmm. future costs and opportunities, it was very clear that the odds for Plantopia to become in the year of 2022 or 2021 mm -hmm would generate uh, revenues quickly w is unlikely to happen. So yeah, that was okay. really the factors. Mm -hmm. uh, and for them, it was an easier position to take the counterpart and say, well, maybe we can still grow it. So the game was making uh, good revenues and so on, mm -hmm. but could it go to the next level? Okay. Um, and, and this is where by sharing okay. those numbers, those estimates mm -hmm. we've done, like they agreed on the decision, right? So it was actually based on... Uh, data like it was an informed decision and yeah, not just okay. gut feeling and uh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. i like those uh way better mm -hmm. than the gut feelings or the emotional driving uh, <laughs> yeah yeah decisions but it's you know the thing is uh like you said uh maybe for other studio this would be kind of like a good game to grow 
because uh well other companies different cash flows and of course different yeah. expectations and you know like i'm hearing a lot all of these like hey, well but supercell is in the soft launch for, or was in the soft launch for one and a half years yeah well, you look so it's supercell they have a lot of money on their bank account and they can afford it if you are in the soft launch for a year and you're not moving anywhere like hey so you know tr- <laughs> try to think about either a pivot or you know how actually can you can um, improve the game so yeah okay so i have uh, i have this like model situation i already uh, uh, briefly touched it so uh, we have a game in a soft launch and um, our kpis are really really close to our goals but they're just not quite there yet and we released a new version with uh, our last feature that we had in the in the product uh, uh, pro, the roadmap. The KPI still did not meet the goals, but we're almost there. So, uh, so what should we do? <laughs> any, any, any ideas? Any, any pointers? Like, what should we do? Should we kill the game? Shouldn't we? What should we do? <laughs> yeah, and then what you describe, I think, is probably eighty percent of the situations of games. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I uh, and it, it's kind of a hard truth. Um, is I reflected a lot on this, and if you have something that really takes off, you know mm-hmm. that it takes off, right? So yeah. uh, I think it's about uh, it's about being honest with yourself, also as a team. Like, are you persisting really hard on 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 the wrong direction? And it's human to want to figure out and crack the problem, and sometimes you can, mm-hmm. and sometimes you don't understand, and you just have to decide to move on. So a question I ask myself often in any game development or what, what I do and also with a team, uh, how should we spend our time? You know, how should mm. we spend our time? Yeah. Are we spending uh, spending our time in a meaningful way uh, with impact? And what I look at is growth, right? So are we uh, getting better from iteration to another? And sometimes you can take a step back and yeah. a step forward. But I would say giving at least two tries. And if you see... Uh, it's going nowhere. It's really time to ask yourself, maybe you want to do a first try, but this is the last call, right? So yeah. because you can go in circle for forever and it's it's, it's leading to nowhere. Until you it run out of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think setting a time. So when you are a small business where uh, your cash flow dictates how, how long, yeah. how much you can, you know, uh, fail with iteration, mm-hmm. then it's much easier to think about this because you think, how many iteration or how many months do we have? And uh, if we make a decision now with the months we have left, we still have some yeah. time to rebuild. I would rebuild actually more based on the core of what you built before. So not start from zero, but uh, instead of trying to save, you know, so uh, instead yeah. of pivot, sometimes it's just, you know, you take the core of the pieces that work and you rebuild something. Yeah, it, and, and uh, you're right about like this is... Uh... 80 to 90 percent of the conversation i'm having uh, uh, almost all the time with, the, with mm. the companies and it's really hard i mean of course because what if the next iteration is the one that we you know we hit the goals and then we we start to grow but i'm i think like it's it's never happened like it's never the the last one it's always mm. like oh well we should try this and that but i always say like if you are stagnating or just your KPIs are not moving up or down or not improving for three iterations in a row. It's just like, yeah, that's the time. Like, hey, just stop. Think about what what you've done, what you have in the pipeline or what are your next plans. And then just if if it's not enough, then just kill it and move on. I mean, it's hard, but you know, like, yeah. (laughs) How do you want to spend time? You want to just run in circles or you want to build something that can actually grow maybe? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. it's very motivating for a team, right? When they yeah. uh, they they want to work on something that matter, right? So um. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. So I have like three last questions, but before we go into that, you you mentioned on at the beginning just very brief, like you're taking a a break or a time off. Is that uh, that I understood correctly? Can you elaborate a little bit more uh, on that, yeah. if if you want? Yeah, sure, sure. It's it's not official yet, but I'm happy to um, share it here in in this podcast. So I've been in transition as well in career at the moment where I'm no longer uh, with Voodoo. 
Okay. Uh, but I've been also exploring different paths, and uh, I actually share uh, about it in the, the newsletter I, I'm, mm. I'm starting this month. Uh, uh, nice. it, it is an interesting phase because you know when you take you force yourself to take a break and not just go with your, your script, uh, mm -hmm. like what yeah. you know you do, you're good at, and then you take a step back. It's like okay, where am I in this phase? What do I want to do? Where can I be uh, useful? You know, uh, it's an interesting phase. Uh, uncomfortable at first but uh, yeah. yeah i'm exploring different paths whether it's uh, with a company independently with rise and mm, play yeah. and uh, i don't know where it will go but nice. i'm i'm uh, just you know embracing the uncertainty yeah that's, uh, like that's perfect with game development you know <laughs> and uh settle when there's something as well that feels mm. right yeah because you know all the magic happens as soon as you're out of your comfort zone that's mm -hmm. that's uh, that's always that's always like that so I guess, I mean, that's kind of connects to my question, like what keeps you up at night these days? <laughs> a little bit. You uh, about this. I, so I have to say something that made me really happy with a like time mm -hmm. off. Uh, like when people ask me that like, you must be so happy to have some time off and chill. I was like, I've been working hard. I, like, I've, I don't think I've worked as hard since I can't remember last time, yeah. although I'm technically free, but I've been a lot on the podcast. I think it's like yeah. uh, one thing I've found like, really um, writing to people that I find really interesting or I, I saw some mention about uh, them in some article success mm. they achieved and uh, that's what uh, you know it, it's the creative thinking and I, like, I think like oh it would be great to talk to that person or oh I could imagine uh, maybe focusing uh, something that uh, really was a spark uh, out of those uh, creative nights yep. I want to do a session an episode on a financial coaching literacy oh, nice. okay. so uh how can you f how do you think about uh financing uh wealth management assets uh what is an asset liability and giving a fi financial literacy to the listeners mm -hmm. uh, because it's very helpful for a business uh yeah. if you want to start something but also helpful if you want to start to be an investor and i mm -hmm. see it's missing in the space uh, i want to make it more accessible as well so i've been very excited about this nice. Okay, yeah, that sounds that sounds super interesting. And one last question, and then we have this like rapid quiz, like call a bond segment. Uh, so, mm -hmm. what's what's your favorite book, and and why? I took this from Joachim uh, actually because it was super interesting, and I, I love the question. So, thank you, Joachim. <laughs> <laughs> so, a book I come back often to to also check with my leadership practices is the 15 mm -hmm. commitments of conscious leadership and that's what inspired me a lot actually with a uh, name of conscious leadership uh, with rise and play mm -hmm. and the offer is really uh thinking holistically like as a, as a leader like be you know really more human so connected with your emotions understand how emotion work uh, instead of uh, seeing the world that happens to you it happens by you. So how can you uh, control, you know, mm -hmm. a more your reaction, your perception, uh, your uh, yeah, your your actions to the events that happen to you? And so it's also uh, inspired a lot uh, from Stoicism, which I have mm -hmm. other books also inspired me here. But that really gave me uh, focus and structure in my approach to leadership and, and life, uh, I would say in general, and that's what I try to advocate with Rise and Play. Nice. Well, it's. Uh, I will. I will share the the link in the show notes for for that book. All right. So this is uh, is kind of like fun uh, at the end, which is a bonus segment, rapid quiz. So you, I have a set of multiple questions, which is super simple. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. You have one or two seconds to to answer, and it's just like black or white. What would you choose? And you say black or whatever. So mm -hmm. let's see. Let's see. Don't worry. It's fine. So it's uh, iOS or Google Play. Or Android. Or iOS, uh, or iOS. Android. iOS. <laughs> right. Ma your masterclass or podcast? Podcast. Berlin or Helsinki? Berlin. Ah, nice. Uh, books or movies? Uh, ah, that's uh, tough one. Movies. That's tough one. Movies. movies. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. The last question. It's, it's super easy. Would you prefer remote work or on site? On site. Nice. Okay. Well, so it's really the part of the brain super intuitive i didn't think about it and <laughs> but it's the one that i trust uh, for this moment so i'm, I'm yeah yeah i'm yeah, okay yeah. with what i i answered <laughs> nice okay <laughs> perfect 
No, thank you, Sophie. This was uh, it's actually pretty amazing. Uh, I'm glad you you were here, and I'm glad that you, I could talk to you. Thank yeah, you very thanks. much. And uh, any any um, where can uh, actually people find you or contact you? Can you share your details? So my most active channel, I would say, again, I'm about focus is really LinkedIn, or then mm. all the materials are on risenplay.io. So okay. everything like they can find resources, masterclass, podcast. That's also another way. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you, Mathieu. Thanks a lot for the chat. Nice. Thank you.